This morning, we're beginning a brand new series we're calling Multiply. And uh, the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about God's desire and ability to produce spiritual fruit in our lives. How many of you know God wants us to produce fruit? John 15, 8 says, when you bear, produce much fruit, my Father is honored and glorified, and you show and prove yourselves to be true followers of mine. You know, if you want to know what a true disciple is, it's not someone that wears a cross around his neck. The proof of a true disciple, according to Jesus, is that you produce fruit. In fact, you produce much fruit. How many of you know the Lord wants every one of us to be fruit producers? Amen. He wants us to be fruit producers, not just to produce fruit, but to produce much fruit, a multiplication of fruit. Amen. The Lord wants us all to be fruitful multipliers. Amen. Now, since the beginning of time, the Lord uh, released an anointing or the grace or the or the power or the ability of multiplication in his creation. And uh, we're going to take a moment to just look at that real quick. God created everything with the ability to multiply. One of the principles of Bible interpretation is called the law of first mention. And the law of first mention says anytime a word is used first in the Bible, its meaning and importance will be consistent throughout the Bible. So in Genesis chapter 1, we find the reference to the principle of multiplication multiple times. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that God created all vegetation with the ability to multiply. In Genesis 1 and 11, then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them. And after their kind, and God saw that it was good. Now from this chapter in Genesis, we learn that God created all vegetation, all plants with the ability to produce seeds or produce fruit that produce seeds. In other words, all vegetation has the purpose and the ability to reproduce or to multiply after itself. A seed falls to the ground, it dies, and what does it do? It multiplies. Jesus said in John 12, 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Vegetation has been created with the ability to multiply. How many of you know that? Number two, God created all creatures with the ability to multiply. All them little bugs that you see walking around, all them little creatures that you see on God's green earth, God created them with the ability to multiply. In Genesis 1, 21, God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the water swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. Now, again, from Genesis 1, we learn that God created every living creature, the Bible tells us, that moves on the earth with the purpose and ability to be fruitful and multiply. You know, you don't have to send them to class. You don't have to teach them, or train them. They, they exist on the earth, and they have the ability to multiply. They have been given the DNA of reproduction. God also created mankind with the ability to, to multiply. In Genesis 1:27, God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So after God created the first humans, Adam and Eve, the very first thing he did was he commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. Now listen. You know why God created male and female? You know why male and female should get married? So they can be fruitful and multiply. That's the reason why God created the difference in anatomy between the male and the female is for the purpose of reproduction and procreation. Hello. Amen. 
So listen, we can see that from the very beginning, it was the Lord's desire for anything and everything that he created to be fruitful and multiply. That's who God is. He's a multiplier. How many of you think that's good news? That he's a multiplier, amen? And finally, God created believers with the ability to spiritually multiply. When God called Abraham, he quickly declared over him his intended purpose of spiritual multiplication. Genesis 17, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. How many of you know Abraham is the father of the faith? What was God declaring to Abraham? He was declaring to Abraham that he was going to multiply his spiritual seed into a multitude of nations. Remember when Jesus called his disciples, he quickly declared over them his intended purpose of multiplication. Matthew 4, 18, Jesus said, Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What was Jesus doing? He was declaring the Father's intended purpose of multiplication over the lives of every believer. Everything God created, including believers, including Christians, He created with the purpose and the ability to multiply. Are you all catching this? This verse that when Jesus uh, commanded His disciples, uh, or the, not, not the, the last thing He ever told His disciples before He left the earth, was the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he teaches them. Now listen, when Jesus gave that ability and command to the disciples, to these few disciples to be fruitful and multiply, he gave that to them, you know, over 2,000 years ago. But do you know that one third of the population on the globe are born again evangelical believers? From those few disciples This thing is multiplied into a third of the population of the earth of born-again evangelical believers. Amen? How many of you believe that's multiplication right there? Now, but there's still much work to do. There's two-thirds that are not yet evangelical believers. Amen? And the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, in verse 9, the Lord is not slow about His promises. Some count slowliness or slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Some of you know the Lord wants everybody to be a Christian. So because God loves the entire world and He wants everyone to be saved from the wrath to come, God wants every one of us, every person, every believer in church to be a multiplier, a reproducer of more spiritual fruit. Amen? He wants us to be soul winners. So how do you do that? God has created believers with the ability to multiply. You know, the fruit tree, as I mentioned, the fruit tree doesn't have to go to class to learn how to produce fruit. These bugs don't have to, you know, it's in their DNA. It's in the fabric of their being. It's how, it's when God designed them, He designed them, and this is what you're going to do. You're going to produce. And how many of you know, as Christians, whenever you become a Christian, it's in you to do what God said we would do and be fishers of men. It's in us. It's already in there. We just got to loose it. Amen. We got to let it go. Amen. We listen. It's already in us. It just needs to come out of us. Amen. And so let's be let's be encouraged today. There are three reasons why every believer can multiply. Number one, every believer has been called to multiply. Matthew 419. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, this calling that Jesus gave to the disciples, how many of you know it wasn't just for those disciples? It was for every disciple to come after them. Right? Right? It's for everybody. So God has called us to be multipliers, and He's given us the calling. It's a calling. How many of you know when you got a calling, 
It's on your life. You can't get, you can't get away from it. It's something that you got to bend for. It's something that, you know, you got to do with your life. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, And this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. See, so winning souls, reaching people, multiplying spiritually is not for clergy. It's not for people that wear robes or that are evangelists, pastors, teachers, prophets. No. First, uh, uh, Ephesians 4.11 says the job of the clergy is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Amen. And so listen, in some circles, and, you know, some of us have been raised to believe, well, you know, come on, you do the work of the ministry, and we're going to cheer you on. Go get them, man. Praise the Lord. Come on, do it faster. Do it harder. Do it more effectively. And no, the Bible says, oh, no, 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 no. What you need to do is get before the people and let them know it's in them to go and bear fruit and loose them and let them go and let them go do what I've called them to do. How many of you know God wants you to be a fruit producer? Amen. Now notice Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. To make you fishers of men means he will show us how to do it. He will show us how to bring and help people get closer to Jesus. How many of you are interested? If you're just willing, if you're just willing to be used of God, God will use you. How many of you know that? And listen, God is not looking for gifted and qualified and charismatic people. He's not looking for that. You know what he's looking for? He's just looking for people that are willing to be used of him. All you have to do is be willing. You don't, have, you don't need, in fact, charisma, gifts, abilities, all of that stuff, it'll just get in your way. It'll just keep you from being used of God because you'll think you can do it on your own and you won't rely on God. And you might add, but you won't multiply because multiplication comes from tapping in to the vine. Amen. First Corinthians 126 says this, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. God chooses not the, not the superstars. He just uses normal people. How many of you feel normal? Don't, don't look at your spouse right now. How many? Come on, how many of you think, at least you think you're normal? Let me see your hands. Hey, you're qualified to be used of God. Amen. Isn't that encouraging, brothers and sisters? I feel all of a sudden greatly encouraged. That maybe I can do something for God. What about you? God wants to use you. Amen. Now listen, not only has every believer been called, but every believer has been empowered to multiply. You've been empowered. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came to them and said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. How many of you know he does have all power and authority? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So Jesus is saying, hey, I possess all power and ability and authority on, in heaven and on earth. I, I have it all. And I will give you this power and this ability if you will just be willing to be used of me. Man, isn't that great? He says, listen, I, I have the last word. I am the one. I am the final answer. I am the Donald Trump. I am the Bill Gates. I am the supreme one of all the kings of the universe. I've, got, I've been given all power and authority. Therefore, go and make disciples. In other words, if you will just go, I will give you my power and ability, and you will experience me like you've never experienced me before in your Christian life. Amen. Amen. God will give you the power and ability to teach God's principles. He will give you the, the gift, spiritual gifts you need to minister to God's people. He will give you spiritual authority to fight and win spiritual battles that you have to wage when you're reaching people. God will help you to overcome fear and timidity and give you the boldness to speak up as a Christ follower. God will help you develop godly character so you can be a good example. Acts 1.8, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, through Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
See, God's power is with us. You know, I remember clearly when I first got saved and I had to hang out with my old friends and to work with my co-workers who knew me before I became a Christian. It was very intimidating. It was hard to face the pressure. The pressure is always there. Because the world wants you to live one way and God wants you to live another way. And when you get in a context where now not everybody is Christians or sometimes even in contexts where they are Christians, sometimes you feel enormous pressure to cave in and act like they act just so they can feel better about themselves. And sometimes you feel like you got to act like the world wants you to act just so they don't reject you and so that you, you don't lose all your friends. But when the Holy Ghost comes on you, I'm telling you, you get to the place where you could care less whether anybody likes it or don't like it. You just got to live your life for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on. I'll tell you how that comes. Through the power of the Spirit. Amen. And God wants us to live his life out there. But we got to be empowered by his Spirit. Amen. And listen, you will never experience the full measure of God's grace on your life until you just say, yes, Lord, I'm willing to be a witness. I'm willing to be an example. Now, the third reason every believer can multiply is this. Every believer has ample opportunity to multiply. We can't use the excuse for why we're not multiplying or being used of God that, man, there's no opportunities out there. How many of you know there's opportunities everywhere? Right. And Jesus said, John 4, 35, he said, don't do you not say there is still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They are already white for harvest. It's like, hey, you know, Jesus says, don't wait for the harvest It's already here. Open your eyes. Look around. Look at the fields. They are already white for harvest. In other words, what he's saying is that the ripe fields is people that need Jesus, that are hungry for Jesus, that are open to Jesus. Amen? We know that's what he was talking about. In Matthew 8 or 9, 36, he's Jesus seeing the multitude or seeing the people. He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful. In other words, there's a lot of fields that you can go work in. There's lots of opportunities for you to share your faith, to reach out with the love of Jesus, if you're willing. Amen? We just got to be willing to go. And if there's anything I can encourage you with today, just say, Jesus, I am willing. Amen? I'm willing, Lord. So how many of you know that at least five people that are either lost, distressed, or dispirited like a sheep without a shepherd? Just two of you? Okay, let me me try it again. How many of you know at least five people that are lost, distressed, dispirited like a sheep without a shepherd? How many of you know at least five? If you don't have five, come talk to me. I can can help you out there. Amen, because, man, they got a lot of them around town, right? Is that right? Lafayette is full of opportunities. Isn't that true? Isn't it true that even though people say I'm a Christian, it's not necessarily so? Come on, are y'all with me out there? Listen, my, my, like you press the button, this is what comes out. You're a Christian, I'm Catholic. That's what I would say. You're a Christian, I'm Catholic. You know what I was trying to do? Get people off my back. I didn't want them to start messing with my business. How many of you know, it don't matter whether you're Catholic, Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, you could be lost as a goose in high weeds regardless of what doctrine or denomination you're under. Amen? And I was just trying to get the heat off of my back. But there's a lot of people out there that need to be saved. Amen? Hey, listen, where you live, where you work, where you go to school, where you hang out, there's opportunities. But Jesus says, listen, the problem is not the opportunities. The real problem is this. There's a shortage of workers. That's a real problem. That's what Jesus said. He said there's a shortage of workers who are willing to take advantage of the tremendous opportunities that are available out there. So I want to be one of those workers that takes advantage of opportunities. What about you? Okay, that's three of us. All right, let me see if I can get more. 
Let me see if I can get more participation. I want to be one of those believers, one of those workers that takes advantage of opportunities that God makes available out there. What about you? Amen. Amen. Just be willing, right? So Matthew 9, 37, Jesus said to the disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. This was Jesus' prayer request. His prayer request was, would you pray for more workers? Would you pray for more workers to take advantage of the opportunities out there? See, God is seeking workers who are willing to be multipliers. He's looking for people. You know, if you want to know what God is up to, He's looking for people. You know what He's looking for? He's looking for workers that are willing to be co-workers with Him. Why? Because it breaks His heart to see people lost like a sheep without a shepherd. It breaks his heart to see people broken with no solutions, no answers, no comfort. They try the things and the ways of the world, but they wake up the next morning depressed, discouraged, because their answer that the world has is not satisfying. And Jesus says, I know the solution. I need some hands and some feet. How many of you are willing to be hands and feet? Amen? Now, what does it take to become a worker who reaches people? Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Now, how many of you know you got to be wise to win souls? I mean, how many of you have seen unwise soul winning? Come on, how many of you have experienced unwise ministry? Come on, y'all help me out, church. Come on. How many of you have been hitting the head with the Bible? Come on, brother, you need to know the word. Boom! Whoa! Man, I got to go to the club, get rid of this headache. <laughs> Takes wisdom to reach the lost. You know, I think of this sometimes, you know, sitting in a pew and watching us as a church just worship God. And I believe, listen, I have never allowed what people think to determine how I'm going to worship God. Amen. Amen? If I want to raise my hand, I'm going to raise my hand. Right. If I want to shout, I'm a shout. Right. But sometimes I don't shout as loud as I want to. Or I don't run as fast as I want to because I'm worried about what people are going to think about me. <laughs> and I'm not worried about what Christians think about me. I'm worried about what the law will think about me. Because, listen, we got to be careful. He who wins souls is wise. So, listen, if we think becoming a soul winner, soul winner is to tuck your big bi a bigger Bible than this under your arm and show up at work Monday morning and throw that boomer on your desk and say, praise the Lord. The believer has just arrived. That might not be very effective. You know, sometimes we got to just think about this a little bit. So let me just give you a couple of thoughts. Three, why, three keys to reach souls for Christ. There's, this is just, you know, touching the surface, okay? But just be willing. You know, in, in John 15, 17, Jesus said to them, My Father is always at work to this very day. I, too, am working. Do you know God's in the process of reaching some people right now? Right now. See, way back 30 years ago, when people were in church, they had no idea that God was working on me like nobody's business. And I looked like I was the least possible candidate to be saved. I was a first-class heathen, man. But how many of you know, it doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. It's what's going on on the inside. And God is always working. He's working right now. He's drawing people to himself. He's tugging on people's hearts. He's softening people's hard hearts right now. And so we got to look out. He's always working. So listen, God's always in the process of working on people all around us. It's our job to be willing and available to find out who God's working on. It takes spiritual discernment. It takes soberness. I mean, we can just live our life like, like, man, we got our ticket, man. I'm on the cruise liner and not worry about the rest of the world. But, man, do we really want everybody else to be left behind? 
Or do we need to keep our spiritual eyes and ears open and get involved with Him in this process? You know, listen, something to consider while reaching people with the love of God is two times people are most open to the gospel is in transition and under tension. In transition, when they're moving to a new place, you know, like those that are involved in Chi Alpha, when these students come to Lafayette and they move from another place, they don't have any friends. They become open to the gospel because they have their, 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 their security has been taken out from under them. Their parents, their, you know, everything they know is normal is not there anymore. When somebody starts a new job and they're the new kid on the block, man, that's an insecure place. You don't know anybody. You don't know if you're going to be accepted or rejected. It, they become susceptible to the gospel. Amen? When people are newly married or first-time parents, in transition, but also under tension, when people are feeling depressed or discouraged, whenever they have financial pressure, those are times that you will be, people will be open to the gospel. Amen? And so listen, we have to be willing. But number two, we have to be normal. We have to be normal, as I was saying earlier. You know, like, you know, how many of you know lost people are not supposed to know Christianese? You know what I mean by Christianese? Praise the Lord, the blood of Jesus, sanctification, I'm justified by faith. You know, and they like, what? Hello. Don't be weird. Be real. Listen, don't be hyper spiritual, critical, and judgmental. Be genuine. Right? Come on, you know, that speaks louder than the Bible chapter and verse. Just be a good example of what Christ is supposed to be like. I mean, none of us are a great example, but just try to be a good example, the best example that you can be. Think about it. If Jesus showed up at your work, how would he act? How would he behave? And you act like that. Amen? 2 Corinthians 2, 3 says, the only letter of recommendation we need is you yourselves. Your lives are a letter written in our hearts. Everyone can read it, recognize our good work among you. Clearly, you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. So in other words, we are the only Bible a lot of people is going to ever read. We're the first Bible that people are going to ever read. And if they see in us a reflection of Jesus... It will cause them to be more open to the gospel. Is this true? You think this is true? Do y'all think this is right? Come on, how many of you are sitting here today? There's no way that you would have responded to somebody beating you over the head and telling you what a, what a low-down, non-believing, heathen, crazy man you were. You know what I'm saying? You know, what's, what's that saying? You can get a lot more bees with honey than vinegar. You know, so listen, we are the letter. People are watching us. You see, sometimes we never know who's watching us. If we don't know that they're checking us out. They're trying to see if it's real. They watch us whenever we go through tough times and see how we're going to respond. They watch us whenever, whenever conversations are going around us and they're all ungodly and, un, un, and, and they're not worthy of participating. They're watching us. They're smiling and they're watching us to see if we're going to jump in on that thing. See, whenever they're down and out and they're going through problems, they're wanting to see, is there any compassion there? I know they say they're a Christian, but do they have any compassion? Do they have any love in their heart? And then finally, the third key to winning people towards Christ is be friendly. Be friendly. It all begins with friendship, right? How many of you know people who don't like you won't be influenced by you? <laughs> I mean, come on. Tweet that. Come on. Tweet that. That's a good one right there. Amen. If they don't like you, they don't want to know about who you're serving. The first step is be a friend. Be like good to hang out with. Fun to be with. Amen. Be friendly. Right? We better wrap this up. Matthew 9.10 says this. 
Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? And when Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So listen, Jesus never got too spiritual that he couldn't associate with people that weren't where they needed to be spiritually yet. He was secure enough in himself to be able to do that. But listen, neither did he get so weak spiritually that his spiritual life was influenced negatively by sinners either. So you know what I found is you got to be careful about how much you hang around with who. Because you might be talking like them in a short time. It has everything to do with how strong you are in the Lord. Tapping into the vine, right? And it has everything to do with your purpose. Because you see, some people want to go hang out with the sinners because they like the environment. That's why they want to be there. They ain't interested in touching nobody with the love of Jesus. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody here this morning. Come on, why are you there? Your purpose has to be, I want to share the love of God with lost people. Amen? Come on, are y'all with me out there? Listen, Jesus was purposeful in what he did, who he hung out with, because he wanted them to know that that there was a solution to their problem. See, God is seeking workers. And I believe that this church this morning is full of workers. But come on, we got to get off our spiritual high horse. Come on, we got to drop self-righteousness. And now listen, some people say, they come to church and they criticize the church and say, church people, church people. Listen, talk to Jesus about that. That's his bride. But listen, you make the difference, man. If you know what a Christian is supposed to be like, quit using an excuse to not being one and be one and give us an example to follow. Come on, that's, that's baloney, man. That's the, that's the lie of the enemy to give you an excuse to be off the hook. You're not off the hook if you're a child of God. You are called to be a worker in God's kingdom. Amen. Now listen, I believe we can make a difference. Imagine if every one of us in this room reach one person. One person. Multiply the number of people in this room one time. How many of you think that would be worth shouting about right there? Amen. Someone, I believe that God can give us one person. One person. Amen. Hey, here's the keys right here. Be willing. Number two, be normal. Amen. And number three, be friendly. How many of you think you can do that? Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's pray today. Let's pray and ask God to help us. How many of you willing? Let's start there. How many of you willing? Come on, how many of you willing to say, say, God, use me. God, use me. Come on, if you're willing, I'm going to ask you to just, come on, just present yourself to God right now. Come on, just lift your hands before the Lord. If you have the liberty, if you have the freedom, come on, let's just say, God, I'm a living sacrifice today. God, I want to be used of you. God, I want to make a difference today. Come on, let's just say, Lord, we're willing. Come on, God's working. I believe God can give you one. I believe God can give you one. Amen. Come on, I believe God can give me one. I believe God can give us all one. Y'all believe it? Do y'all believe it this morning, saints? Do y'all believe God can give us one? Come on, let's ask him, Lord, help me to be normal. Help me to be normal, Lord. Help me to be normal. God, help me. Help me to be a normal Christian. Not a judgmental, not a critical, not, Lord, not a not a weird Christian. Lord, help me to just be normal, oh God. Lord God, we pray for the grace to do that. Now let's ask the Lord, Lord, help me to be relational. Help me to be friendly. Help me not to be so cold, so curt, so close. Help me to be friendly. Help me, God, to not just be always thinking about me, but be thinking about others. Help me, God, to be the friendliest person where I work, where I live, in my family. Help us, Lord, to be the friendliest one around. God, we need your grace. We need your power, and we need your provision today. Thank you, Lord, for the grace of God that is in this room. Thank you, Lord, we're salt, we're light, and we're going to make a difference for the kingdom and for the glory of God. 
Now listen, one more minute, one more minute. If you would, just drop your hands now. Just bow your head for just a minute. If you're in this room today and you say, Todd, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Christian yet. But I want to be a Christian. I want to live the Christian life. Would you pray for me? If that's you, just don't be ashamed. Don't be timid. Raise your hand and say, pray for me. Pray for me. I want, I want to be a believer. I see your hand over here, ma'am. Anywhere else. Anywhere. Raise it high. Raise it high so I can see it. All right. Well, let's pray. I see way back here. Those of you that raise your hands, listen. As soon as we finish praying, I want you to come up here and, and wait until you. I can just shake your hand. i got a gift for you. For just praying that prayer. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for dying on the cross. Come on, just tell the Lord that. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood so my sins could be forgiven. Lord, I want to be a child of God. Help me, Lord, to be a believer. Help me, Lord, to live the Christian life. I surrender to you today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Listen, if you pray that prayer for the first time, and there's a few hands, come up and tell me, okay? Tell me. I want to give you a gift. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be weird. I just want to encourage you. Amen? Amen. Well, God bless you. Come on, saints. Let's go out and make a difference for Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.